me king, then you have made me king. You don't have a throne to give. On a practical level, what do you think Rome's response would be to this groundswell of, of euphoric emotion to crown this Galilean king? I mean, I mean, hey, right? The, the shooting's going to start almost immediately. Does that, does, you agree? So Jesus understands that this is not the way I can do this. This is not the way, this is not what I came to do. And, and Jesus has a, a focus, a dedication to his, his mission that is admirable and that we should emulate. When you remember what God has given you to do, when you remember what God has placed you in this world to do, what he's anointed you to do, right? There shouldn't be anything that dissuades us or distracts us or discourages us because it's the God of heaven that calls us. Same God that made us. Same God that had us in mind before he made the world. So, Lord, if you got all that together, then why shouldn't I just get in step with you and watch you work your plan out in my life. In John's account, it's sandwiched between Jesus' defense of his person and of his ministry. Let's look at, let's look at this since we're in John. Let's look at this. Let's turn back to chapter 5. What John says precedes this feeding of the 5,000 is this. Christ heals a man on the Sabbath, right? And then the Jews get mad because he healed this man on the Sabbath. It caused the man, the man was paralytic. He told the man, take up your bed. The Jews stopped the man and said, hey, you're carrying your bed on the Sabbath. And Jesus' frustration is, you totally missed it. This man has a bed outside, which means this was like his cot. This was his gurney, right? This was his hospital bed. He now is walking, carrying it, and you're mad because he's doing it on the Sabbath rather than perceiving and rejoicing in the fact that the Lord has healed him, right? Jesus gets mad at their overt, let's call it re religiosity. Mm -hmm. you, you're just so religious, right? Jesus gets upset and, and they challenge Jesus and then Jesus begins to point out that one, he's one with God in nature. He says, my father has been working until now, and I am working, right? So wait a minute, you made, you made God your father, so you make yourself God's son, so you make yourself God. Anybody that tells you that Jesus never said he was the son of God is mistaken, because throughout the gospel accounts, you see all kinds of places where Jesus emphatically links himself with God. And here, he's saying, I'm God. Questions or comments so far? All right, he then says, I'm equal with God in nature, I'm equal with God in power. Verse 19 of John chapter 5, Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the father do. For whatever he does, the son also does in like manner. That's a powerful statement. Whatever God does, I do. Can you imagine just Gus at work making that kind of statement? Right? He then says, I'm equal with God in authority. So in nature, I'm equal. In power, I'm equal. I'm equal with God in authority. Verse 22, he says, for, for the Father judges no one, but has committed judgment to the Son. Mm. I'm equal with God in nature. I'm equal with God in power. I'm equal with God in authority. Right? And I've got witnesses. Because... In their, in their culture, you had to have two adult male witnesses to, to any particular legal point that you wanted to make. So he says, I got witnesses. John the Baptist, who you received for a minute as a prophet, until he started talking about me, pointed to me as being the Son of God who came into the world to be the Lamb of God. Amen? Mm -hmm. He then says, but you know what else? My works testify me. The things that I do, you know nobody can heal except God. You know nobody can do the things that I do 
except God gave them the power to do those things, the authority to do those things, the, the very, shared his essence, right? He says, but you know what else? The Father is a witness. Verse 37 of chapter 5 in John, he says, And the Father himself who sent me has testified to me. This is my beloved Son. Hear ye him, right? You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form, but you do not have his word abiding in you, because whom he sent, him you do not believe. Jesus is hammering away at these Jews. You following him? Mm -hmm. He then says, there's the witness of Scripture. Now, Scripture at the time was the Old Testament, mm -hmm. right? right? He says, you search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. You want to find me, read your Old Testament. This, parenthetically, is why I don't support a New Testament church that won't present the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Because Jesus himself says that the Old Testament is what declares mm -hmm. me. Amen. The Old Testament is what presented me in the first place. Mm -hmm. What pointed mm -hmm. man in the direction of looking for me. When Jesus appeared to the disciples who were on the road to Damascus, the Bible says he began talking about the Old Testament. Explaining how it was necessary that the Son of Man would come and would suffer and on the third day be, be resurrected. So the Old Testament is critical to our understanding of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Amen? Mm -hmm. So Jesus is hammering away at them. Listen, one in nature, one in power, one in authority. We have witnesses. John the Baptist is a witness. My works are a witness. The Father himself is a witness. The scriptures are a witness. And yet they still want to make him king on the basis of fish and bread. Now, let me ask you. Let's think about what the disciples have been through. Next slide, please. Let's think about what the disciples have been through. And let's put yourself in, you can go to the next one. Let's put yourself in, in their shoes. We have been walking with Jesus. Just about everywhere we've been recently, Jesus has come under attack by the religious authorities. Right? You know in your hearts that the religious authorities are wrong about Jesus. And you are convinced, based on the fact that he's done, among other things, healed people, calmed the storm, spoken like no man has ever, ever spoken, captivated your own heart, caused you to leave home, caused you to leave your business, caused you to leave your family and go embark on this journey. He's given you personally the ability to cast out demons and given you power over unclean spirits and you have gone out and done some tremendous things that you've never been able to do in your life and that you realize you can only do because of the authority that he's granted you. Right? The religious leaders are wrong. Now, here we have a crowd of perhaps 20,000 people who want to make you king. Everybody in the United Center wants to put a statue of you outside that's bigger than the Jordan statue. And they want to say, you are absolutely the man. If you're a disciple, what do you want to do? Come on, just be honest. What do you, what do you want to do? He's your hero. Yeah, you want it to happen because you're yeah. the number two man. Yeah. Are you kidding? 20,000 people, right? This is the entourage, right? 20,000 people want to make the guy that you've been traveling with, king. You have, by association, received a lot of the abuse that he's received. Because when they look at him like he's crazy, this goes back to anybody, any Star Wars fans? Right? In the first Star Wars movie, Obi-Wan Kenobi raises this question. Who is the bigger fool? The fool or the fool who follows the fool? 
So, by association, if Jesus is a fool, then you 12 are complete idiots. <laughs> right? I mean, I have, I have, by association, I have picked up on some of the scorn and ridicule that has been directed towards this man. If he's a sinner who has a devil, then I've perhaps been accused of being a sinner who has a devil. If he has lost social standing, I have lost social standing. Stands to reason, if his stock rises, my stock rises because I got in on the ground floor. Right? I was one of the first ones the this man, right? You know, I'm, I'm, one of the, I'm one of the ones I left early, right? If I were a disciple and they wanted to make Jesus king, we've been through everything we've been through recently. And I can't stress enough, he's given you ample reason to know that he's God. He just calmed a storm that rose up on the sea by yelling at the wind and telling the waves to, to lay down. So, I mean, this is not, you know, something crazy. This is not something beyond the realm of possibility. We know who he is. I'm like, Jesus, let's go and make some moves. Let's go ahead and do this, right? Isn't that reasonable? Yeah. But what does Jesus do? Back to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6 verse 45 says, Immediately he made his disciples to get into the boat. Next slide. I want to show you where they, where they are. And I, and I actually can use my little pointer for this. Okay. This, can you see that? This is the Sea of Galilee. Okay. They start... Jesus kind of is headquartered at Capernaum, okay? Bethsaida is a little south and a little west on the other side of the lake. So basically what, the, what Jesus and the disciples have been doing has been, they've been centralized here in Capernaum and they've been working their way up the northern coast of the Sea of Galilee. You see that? Mm -hmm. Now what you can't see is this is, because of the stars here, that's actually water. So initially, when Jesus needs to get away from the crowd, they're right in here, and they start heading northward that way, okay? And that's how the people are able to follow them on foot, okay? He tells his disciples when they're up in here somewhere, get in the boat and go over there to Bethsaida. He made them go. Why did he make them go? Because I don't want to be king this way. Make sense? We, if we stay here, you all are going to get caught up. So I'm insisting that you get in the boat. Next slide. I'm insisting that you get in the boat. They were made to leave and told to take the boat to the other side. Now, here is the experiential context. Here's what the disciples have been. I've alluded to, you know, kind of the, the difficulty of following Jesus when he's being disrespected and so forth. But he now is making them get in that same boat that they've been riding in. That same boat. I mean, think about it. If you had been in a boat that just about was shipwrecked by, by a storm, would you want to get right back in that boat? <laughs> Would you want to get right back in that boat without Jesus? What would be going through your own mind? Anybody ever been in a car accident? 